All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Timothy Nishimoto at his home. Uh, it's February 18th, 2022. Timothy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, the first question, the biggest one to get us started for this is why wine? Why wine? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> in, well, it's, it's a good thing we have some time. <laughs> um, you know, I I, uh, I was in, I have been in the restaurant business my whole life. I uh, uh, was uh, managing a restaurant, and uh, when I was 20 or 21 um, in LA, it's where I grew up, and um, I I had a friend who was really into Gurkitch Hills Chardonnay. And, um, you know, I, I had, before that, I'd, I'd had Almaden or, you know, just, I had, I didn't like wine at all. Um, but um, when I had Gurga Chills Chardonnay, it just, it was like, that was my aha moment. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just, I just gained such a passion for it um, with other friends who were really into Oki, big Oki Chardonnays from California. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, and being in the restaurant business, uh, it just, it was kind of just, it all just kind of worked together. And, you know, um, I always knew that I wanted to open my own restaurant and, um, I didn't know that my own restaurant would actually be more of a wine bar. Um, and, uh, so I opened that in 2005 and, um, yeah, I just I just gained such a passion for it over the years, and you know, just really into f wine and food pairings. I, I mean, pairing wine with food is and beer with food uh, is is my biggest passion in life, even more than music. Um, I mean, it's um, it's fun. You can drink your hobby, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's. It it's uh, yeah I, I, I there's so much to it you know so so you mentioned growing up in L A and, and getting into restaurants early on uh, tell me about kind of uh, p post high school what 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 was sort of the first step for you and and what what were you sort of thinking at that point as long term aspiration uh, after high school I well I played tennis competitively uh, in junior high and high school and um, my plan was to be a tennis player <laughs> and uh, didn't work out that way you know in, in college I, I didn't do so well I did really well in high school and junior high but college just you know mm -hmm. I just kind of lost it anyway um, and you know I was I was working in restaurants and uh, like I said I, I knew I wanted to open my, my own place mm -hmm. And that was always a goal for me. I, I, after high school, there were a few years where I was focusing on um, acting mm -hmm. and dance. And um, I was planning on going to UCLA for theater. Mm -hmm. uh, but my father said, if you're gonna go to college and I'm gonna pay for it, you're gonna go for a reason. <laughs> and so get up, he said, just said, you know, Get a business degree. Just get get your business degree. You can sing. You can dance. You can act. You can model. You can do whatever you want to do. But just just you know, get your business degree. So I focused on uh, on business. I got a degree in um, uh, well, it was management information systems, computer information systems. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to Cal State Long Beach uh, for that, and. Um, and you know, one of my projects in accounting was um, was a semester long um, project f to work on a business, and mine was the restaurant, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, it was during that time. I think that was a really pivotal moment. I think for me, like I said, I knew I always wanted to ha have my own place, but that was when I really focused on it, and you know, looked at the business side of it, and. You know, and again, at the same time, I was I was really getting into really getting into good food uh, and good good wines, mm -hmm. and it was it was all just kind of 
you know, boiling. It got to a boiling point, you know, and I, one of the reasons actually that I left LA was because I knew that, I mean, it was the, 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 the uh, restaurant business there is just, it's really tough. And you can be really hot for a year or less, really, really hot. And then you're, and then there's another restaurant that just kind of gets hot, takes all your business away. Or, I mean, it happens everywhere, but it, it really felt so clear to me that I, I, it was, I, I, it was going to be really hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when I came, I visited Portland and I just felt like, you know, I felt like I could make my mark in Portland. It just felt, you know, it just, it, it, uh, so having grown up and live, lived, um, in the Long Beach area, um, but also spending a lot of time in, in LA, West Hollywood, um, um, I, I felt like Portland was a nice mix of LA and Long Beach. More, it just, it felt so comfortable and you know, there was one restaurant, it was Zephyro, that was kind of hip and cool. And I thought, this town needs some cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And and it just, and, you know, and I just, people are so friendly. And it just felt, I just had a, it just felt like, I felt like I was at home after just a couple of days just visiting. And so, um, yeah, I mean, um, I don't remember what your original question was, but... You know, that's kind of how it all happened for me. I just, um, I felt like I could make my mark here in, in, mm -hmm. or in Portland. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're, we're in Hillsboro now, today, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. So when, when you got up here, what was the, what did you do initially? What was your kind of initial foray into Portland? Uh, well, so I uh, managed, I uh, was a general manager for Santa Fe Taqueria, mm -hmm. um, and they had, three restaurants, I think, at that time. And, um, yeah, and then, you know, just, I kind of worked, I worked at Papa Hayden. I kind of worked at its, a few different places. Um, but one of the places that really um, made an impression on me and my career was Bima. Um, and, it, it, I mean, in fact, that restaurant was pretty short-lived. I think it, it was from, like, uh, 95 through 2000 mm -hmm. um, so it was pretty short-lived itself but um, you know I just met a lot of people that um, that I'm still friends with now I mean it was just it was just a great incredible uh, group of people that worked there and the owners were amazing um, and uh, and you know I was involved in the wine program there and uh, and uh, and then, actually, when I left Bima, I, oh, I worked at Oba for a while. Um, when I left, I, I was kind of ready. I kind of wanted to get out of the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. And um, but then, you know, sure enough, I uh, got a job with Nature's. Um, actually, my first day at Nature's was the last was the was the day that they announced that Wild Oats was taking over. Um, so I so I was hired as a um, specialty foods manager, um, and then you know, and that which included wine and beer, you know, all the fancy cheeses and uh, charcuterie and uh, oils and sp spices and things, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, and that's where I really really grasped onto the idea of getting in the, like specifically in the wine business. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, uh, we, had, uh, we had one buyer that was local and we had eight store, eight wild oat stores with wine, uh, with wine stewards. And I was a wine, one of the wine stewards. And, um, and we, we'd get together once a week and taste blind. The buyer would, um, would gather <coughs> all, the, all the samples and put them in groups and and that was in that room was where it really, really clicked mm -hmm. that I want to be in the wine business, like specifically in the wine business. Mm -hmm. um, just being with with 
you know, seven other or eight other like-minded people and, you know, with the passion for wine and hearing their descriptions and just learning how to taste wine and, how, and really how to appreciate it and, and um, savor it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it was, it just be, it was so fun and it's, and it's still just so fun to, I love just tasting wine and just, and analyzing it and like, you know, Nobody really needs to know, you know, unless you're, you know, writing a description, writing copy for, for you know, for a story or something. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you're home alone, and you're, you know, you don't re I don't really need to, you know, analyze the wine. But every single sip of wine, I'm, I analyze it and I think about what food will go with it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and again, in that room and, you know, with the other uh, wine stewards, the other wine buyers, um, that, you know, again, this hearing the descriptions and just, that's where I learned how to, how to describe wines, you, you know, even more than I had been. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's where I became super confident mm -hmm. in my, with my palate and, uh, yeah. And so I did that for six years and it's, I loved it. I loved it. Um, and yeah, I, I still, I mean, that was, so I left Wild Oats in 2005. Um, and I still, drew, I would go back to, well, obviously Wild Oats was bought out by Whole Foods. Um, and I, I love that environment and, you know, the, the natural food environment. Um, and um, I didn't really care that much about organic and natural and all that stuff before I started working there. Mm -hmm. I've always eaten well, always drunk well, drank well, um, but um, you know, I, I, I felt like that was a, just an incredible environment and the people uh, were just all, all working towards the same goal, you know, I think in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got this idea to open up a wine shop. Um, and uh, so I'm, uh, I'm in a band called Pink Martini. Um, at the time, so when Pink Martini st first started in 94, I was a guest vocalist. And, uh, and then there were five or six years where I wasn't involved at all. And uh, so when I was at Wild Oats, um, I ended up joining the band full time and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to stay with Wild Oats and I had this crazy idea that I would um, open up a, sh a wine shop and where I wouldn't have to be, th be there all the time. I'd be able to be on the road with Pink Martini mm -hmm. and, uh, and actually at the time our, the, the founding manager uh, John Brody had a restaurant uh, called um, La Happy. It was a crepe, crepe restaurant and bar. And I specifically remember we were on the road, and I was telling him about about uh, my idea to open up a wine shop. And he said, and I said, what What's your experience like? And he says, he's like, I don't. He's like, I don't work there that often. I I kind of do the book. I'm I'm I, when I get there, I'm kind of just in the way. And I, I thought. I want to own a restaurant, just be in the way, <laughs> and I don't have don't have to do much. Yeah, you, know, you know, just kind of back, you know, behind the scenes, and you know, I I'm a people person, so of course, if I'm there, I, I can mingle with people, but I w didn't really want to have to have to work, you know. And that was my uh, the, uh, goal was to have a wine shop uh, where I could just kind of manage it from afar, and um, and then. It's just so happened uh, a friend of mine, Tara, and I were um, we were in a in a I'm a percussionist um, and vocalist for the band, mm -hmm. and uh, she, my friend Tara and I were in a drumming class, a congo class together. And she and her husband own Venopolis uh, downtown, and um, and she was uh, good friends with the the guys that owned Vigne, the wine bar in the Pearl District. And she told me that it was for sale, and I thought I was like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want a wine bar, I don't want to get in the restaurant business. I just back in the restaurant business. I, I just want to have a wine shop, 
And um, and next thing I knew, I was, you know, the, I had the keys for <laughs> for being in this wine bar, and you know, it's like you know. And uh, wow, that was and that was 2005, and that was just I mean it was, and it was an amazing. I will never forget the moment opening the the place with my my key to my own place, and I mean it was incredible incredible feeling like that was my biggest goal, mm -hmm. my whole life, mm -hmm. was to own a a place of my own. And you know, for many years, it was specifically I wanted it was a restaurant, and I had a very clear vision of what I wanted. And then it kind of, you know, changed here and there over the years, <laughs> you know. And um, and then yeah, like I like I said, so we uh, changed the name to Vino Paradiso, and and again, it was in the Pearl District. And then and I I love I loved it. And I hated it. And I mean, the hardest thing was being on the road because, you know, the band travels. I mean, we're on the road about 175 days a year. So it's not like a full 175 days and then the next, the rest of the year off, it's chunks, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was so hard because I had, I had to work. <laughs> I wasn't just in the way. I was in the way, but I wasn't just in the way. I was, you know, I had to, I was behind the bar. I was, and there were, there were a couple years where I was waiting tables as well. And, you know, and there were so many times when I would do like a four week tour, it, it, like in Europe, and I would get off the plane and take a cab take a cab to the restaurant and start working, like literally hit the ground running. It's so many times. And um, that was really, it was really tough. I, I loved it. Like I just, I, I'm, a, I'm a people person. And if anyone who's at my place who wants to, has any kind of uh, 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 desire to learn or to share, they're what they know, you know. I mean, it was such a great environment for me, and I, you know, I know that we, that that we had a lot of really great regular customers, um, who said, "There's nothing else. There's nothing like it," mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the time, 2005. I mean, Veen, Veen opened, I think, 2002 or three. They weren't open for very long, but they were. They, I think Veen might have been the one of the, well, it was one of the first. I think um, Noble Rot might have been the, like the first like bona fide wine bar mm -hmm. in Portland. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I don't I don't even know if they're still around, but um, but you know Veen. I mean, so 2005 was still really mm -hmm. it was early. It was an early the early days of the wine bar the wine bar concept in Portland. And um, you know it was you know business was and then 2008 hit, and I, you know I, I it really felt we really really felt it. Mm -hmm. The the I mean the economic crash it it was crazy like 2005 2006 2007 sales were great, 2008 I mean it tanked, mm -hmm. and um, and it just you know made it really hard you know we. We were still, the band was still traveling and all that, so, you know, and truth be told, you know, most of my income has been from Pink Martini and from um, album royalties and stuff, and now not so much of the album royalties because of, you know, Spotify and Pandora and all that, streaming services, but, um, so I hadn't, it wasn't really the income that I was really worried about, it was just the staff, I wanted them to all be really happy. I wanted it to be busy. I wanted everyone to make money. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, and it was stressful, you know, and um, it was really, it was really difficult. It was the, like literally the best years of my life and the, and the absolute worst years of my life. And, um, but I, I wouldn't trade it for, the, for anything, mm -hmm. you know? And again, just that the experience of, you know, pouring wine and talking about wine and you know that's my job is to talk about wine and that's you know all day long and like you know we had some amazing chefs 
um, and you know a, f a few in particular. Um, it, but we did um, we tried to be consistent with wine dinners, monthly wine dinners, um, where we'd bring in a, a winery and you know the uh, you, typically the winemaker, um, and that was my that was the best day of the month for me, you know. Like, and, and building up to that, just work, sitting down and working with the chef, you know, to uh, come up with, you know, five or six or seven courses paired with this, per, like the perfect wine, mm -hmm. and just the pro the whole process of it, um, it was like I I I loved that. It was like I said, and in the actual night of the of the wine dinners. Um, was just I, I mean I was just on a cloud nine. I like I loved it and you know and the people were you know were really into the pairings and just you know hearing you know people's reactions and um and you know and then just you know and just being so proud of my chefs you know mm -hmm. um, and just working as a team and um, yeah and then so in 2011 we. You know, because sales were still just, you know, t had, were still tanking in 2010. And I mean, it was getting a little bit better. Um, but then I ha um, had a chef who um, was leaving. Um, and, and I thought, this is a perfect time. Because we had talked about, um, so my, my life partner um, was not my business partner at the time. But, but, um, and we've been together for 18 years now. And so, and it was really young at that time, you know, the, mm -hmm. right, the relationship was really young. It, well, actually, we got, we got together in 2004, so it was right before I opened the wine bar. And he was, his Todd, uh, was very involved, like back, you know, like behind the scenes. He's really into, um, he's really great at organizing and accounting and you know did all that all that stuff and cleaning things and building things and fixing things um, um, but then and we had talked about re, you know, repainting and I said well if we're gonna paint I want to paint it a different color you know and um, and actually when we first opened um, someone did wrote an article about um, about the about Vino Paradiso and it said when you walk into Vino Paradiso it's like stepping into a, a ski lodge on Jupiter, <laughs> and I was like, "That's weird." And I thought, "That's cool. Like, I love that, you know." And um, and so and it was so it was like deep orange, like some deep orange walls. It was very mid-century modern, um, deep orange and like, uh, you know, ice blue and like chartreuse and cool, like cool, really cool lighting. Um, but anyway, so you know, I, when Todd said, "Well, we we need to repaint," and I was like, "Well, I want to paint a different color." If, you know, and then right about that time, the chef quit. Chef quit, and I was like, "We should rebrand. Let's just paint a different color. Let's rebrand as more of a restaurant." Because we, um, when we first opened, we didn't have a. We had a. The, the chef worked on a hot plate, <laughs> and then I think it was 2009. 2009, I think it was, uh, or maybe 2010. We put in a whole hood system and a, you know. Um, uh, six burner stove and all that, but anyway, um, just so we could focus more on food. And the chef we had, Ian, was awesome. Um, and you know, we were really trying to get some attention for the food uh, as well. Um, and we just weren't getting like attention from the media, you know, because of the food, just because they were kept compartmentalizing us as a wine bar mm -hmm. like you know so I thought let's rebrand as Copia and um, so we did that and in 2011 had it got a new chef focused on the food and wine of Piedmont Italy um, and w with obviously we you know we had a big focus on Piedmont but then it was all like Piedmont and Oregon so I mean I had to do, I had to do Oregon and then our um, our wine list, the bottle list, had wines from all around the world mm -hmm. as well, but mm -hmm. um, just because we, I had been collecting it over the years, and um, 
but yeah, so, you know, or Oregon has been a, Oregon wine has been a big focus for me for many years. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, so yeah, so we rebranded as Copia, then we ended up selling it in 2015. And I will never be in the restaurant business again. <laughs> <laughs> for real this time. Well, you know, okay, so my, our, our, the last chef that we had at Copia, uh, and I became really good friends, Adam Rupplinger. Mm -hmm. Um, he stayed, so the guy that bought Copia kept it, kept everything the same, kept the staff, kept everything. In fact, he opened a second one uh, on Mississippi. Um, he called it Copia Bistro, I think. Um, and then he closed both of them after, uh, I think he had, uh, he had my place for a year and a half. So he closed both of them at the same time. Um, but so, you know, so Adam and I had this amazing like relationship where I mean we both loved working together on the wine dinners and we both felt like that would like the wine dinners was the best thing about copia and the and from our perspective you know um, and um, and so we ended up we started uh, uh, trellis uh, curated wine dinners and so our idea was to, because we, you know, we know that there are a lot of wineries that have full kitchens. They have big areas for seating. They just don't have a chef. And they don't have the, the wherewithal to like do wine dinners. So we thought, let's go to the wineries that have a full, full, full kitchen um, and we'll put the, the menu together. We'll work with their wines. And um, so we did, you know, so we did wine dinners in Southern Oregon in uh, you know out in Hood River, a, a few places in in um, the Willamette Valley, uh, and but it, you know and that was really really fun, but it was also a, kind of a lot of work, and there's a reason that no one else does it, <laughs> you know, because it's you know to travel all, all that way. Actually, at the time, Adam was living in in uh, Roseburg, so we so it was kind of. It was harder for him to get out here and harder for me to get over there. And, um, but anyway, so we did that for a few years. And so it's not exactly the restaurant business, but, but I'm done with food service, I think, just on the, in that way. I mean, if I, I would, again, I would, I would still love to own a restaurant and truly not have to do anything. You know what I mean? I, I, to truly be a, a, away from it, have, you know, um, and you know, and I still love the idea of consulting on wine lists because um, I, you know, I'm certified sommelier by the Court of Master Sommeliers, and you know, that was 2010 <laughs> that I passed the test. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's been a while, but um, but I, you know, I've still got my chops, and I'm still really, really into it. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's a, a restaurant in Roseburg that Adam was working at, the Parrot House, and um, he actually went, that was the reason he moved down there, was to, op to be the opening chef at the Parrot House. And I was the wine director for them. So that's something that I really like doing, is being a wine director where I can kind of, you know, um, f focus on the, the wine program mm -hmm. and, you know, work on the direction of the wine program and all that. <clears throat> and that's kind of where my, I think one of my best, my my forte lies hmm. is doing that. Um, so, yeah. And it's kind of crazy, though. <clears throat> the, so we were going to give uh, the keys t to the new owner for Copia on January 1st, 2015. And on New Year's Eve 2014, um, uh, Vern Naito uh, from Made in Oregon uh, was with another, a, a group of Japanese uh, gentlemen. And they were backstage at, in LA at the uh, Walt Disney Concert Hall with us. And someone said, "How's how's the wine bar?" And I said, "Well, we're selling it actually, and tomorrow's you know this is our last day, you know." And they you know and they said, "Well, what are you going to do now?" I said, "Well, I definitely am going to stay in the wine business." I didn't know. I mean, I, I you know for a year for the two years that the, that the Copia was for sale. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I had to stay in the wine business. I didn't, I'm like, what can I do 
rem you know, remotely and be in the wine business. Um, and wh what can I do, in, you know, while traveling? There's, mm -hmm. I just couldn't think of anything. Mm -hmm. And Vern Naito had said, you know, when I said I'm, I want to stay in the wine business, he said, let's talk. And I, I was like, what? And so, uh, two and a half months later, I was the uh, wine buyer for the Made in Oregon stores. At the time, I think we had 11 stores. I think we had 10 stores and the website. Um, and yeah, and, in the, and I, so that was 2015. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so seven years ago. <clears throat> yeah, actually, my, my um, anniversary date is coming up, like in the next couple of weeks. So um, yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. It's amazing. I mean, there's, I do have another little thing that I that I just started. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, no, no rest for the weary. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna come back to that. I want to back up for a second. Okay. Um, change topics. Sorry, that was a long winded. No, and that's I, you exactly, know, I just, yeah. exactly what we're going okay. for here. That's totally fine. Uh, I want to back up to Pink Martini, of course, before we talk about wine some more. Uh, obviously, a, a Portland uh, institution. Uh, I'm curious about you mentioned kind of being there from the beginning, although not consecutively from the beginning. Uh, tell me about uh, your your sort of musical background and 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 how you became to be involved in Pink Martini. Um, <clears throat> I didn't really pursue music. Uh, I grew up singing, so my uh, I grew up in going to church, and my I have an older brother and a younger sister, and um, my whole family's everyone plays an instrument or or several. My sister is a teacher, a music teacher, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we would sing in church as a family up, up at front, and you know, we do, you know, we harmonize and all that stuff, even when I was a little, before my sister was born, and when I was, you know, four, three, four, or five, you know, we would do like four part <laughs> harmonies, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, just, I had a passion, you know, I loved singing, I've always loved singing, and I've always loved dancing. And um, and in high school, I was in a vocal jazz ensemble. Uh, I don't know. I think there were like 25, 20, maybe 30 members. And you know, I just loved the harmonizing thing. And, and then in college, I, like I said, I was in acting and stuff. So I did some um, some musicals. Um, and but I, again, I didn't. You know, when when I when my when I changed my my. Uh, focused from acting uh, to business in college, I kind of just put it like I, I mean, like, like my father said, like, you can do that at any time. Mm -hmm. You can do any, and I kind of just, I didn't think about it much. I didn't pursue music at all after that. Um, and, and then randomly, <clears throat> when I was in 1994, I was, um, Going home, it was kind of late. I, I had, I was managing when I was managing Santa Fe, and I was getting off work. It was like one or two in the morning, and uh, a friend of mine, Meg Coulter, I ran into her. She said, oh, "I'm going to this party at Thomas Lauderdale's place, his apartment, and you should come." And I said, sure, and I, I had met Thomas, but and everyone and everyone who has been outside at all in, in Portland at that time anyway, had seen Thomas on his little scooter, you know. He was unmistakable, you know, he was very unique. You know, had this, he was Asian and glasses and has this white tuft, you know, and you know, he's this wacky little, you know, guy. And um, um, so anyway, so I went to this party and he was playing music and, and, and he was like, now, now, which, now what do you want to hear? Now what do you, and my Meg said, Hey Timothy, you should you should say, sing something. And Thomas is like, oh, "You sing? Well, what what, do you, what kind of?" I said, "I, I, I just like to sing. I, I don't I'm, I don't. There's not a style of me. I'm not, I'm not a voc. I'm not a singer." He's like, "You know," and then so I found myself in his studio the next day, next <laughs> night, picking out a. He had just started Pink Martini, like just I mean, I, in like a month or two. He had just started Pink Martini. It was kind of just, it wasn't like a serious thing. He just kind of, it was kind of originally just a backup band and a, a band to fill in for 
the um, the, uh, the Del Rubio triplets, and then also to play it for uh, political events and things. And um, but yeah, so I found myself in his studio the next day, and he picked out a couple songs for me to sing, and and that's kind of how it happened. And you know, and in those days, we you know we were playing at the 1201, we were playing at just small clubs, you know, and parties and stuff. And um, it wasn't, again, it wasn't super serious, but um, uh, then, you know, eventually it got more serious. And, um, and, and, and I was managing Bima at the time, so I was managing Bima, working and waiting tables one night a week. Um, so I was working like 60 hours a week and trying to do that, and Thomas would, you know, anyway. Um, that's kind of how it happened. It just fell into my lap. What made you decide to join full time? Um, you know, when when I, I so I stopped performing with the band, um, you know, in '96, uh, and then they they opened or they uh, they uh, released their first album, Sympathique, and I went as a guest to the co to the concert. And I was just like, and I just, and it was at the Arlene Schnitzer, and it was just packed, completely packed. And I was like in tears, just thinking, wow, what, what would have happened if I had stayed with the band? I mean, the thing was like, you know, in the early days, I would, I was so nervous, and that was part of the, that was the main reason that I, that I left, was because I was so, so nervous every single time, except one. And... That one time I thought, this is what it's supposed to feel like. And I had so much fun that one time that I wasn't nervous at all. I don't know what happened. I don't know what was going on in my head or, you know, what, what wasn't happening, you know. <laughs> um, and it was just, I just thought, well, why am I doing this to myself? This is stupid. You know, I want to sing. I want to be able to do it. But I, I'm, not, I'm not made for the stage, mm -hmm. you know. And I did tried it for two years. And, you know, people say, oh, you do it, and the more you do it, the more comfortable. You be. But it, I, wasn't more comfortable at the end, except for that one time. Um, and you know, I flubbed the words on a song, and I was literally singing, <laughs> singing like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, a lo it's loud. And we're, it's at a club. No one can hear the, my lyrics anyway. But I literally was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I was getting off. And at the time, I wasn't playing percussion, so I would go do a song front and center. You know, I wait for 30 minutes, nervous as hell, before going on. You know, I couldn't even talk to anyone. I was so nervous. You know, I would hold a drink and be like this, you know. <laughs> and then I'd go do my song and, you know, come off and then maybe do another song later. But I, I flubbed the words on that one song. And I was getting off stage and he, and he I had to pass the, the piano and he grabbed my arm and said, are you going to remember the words next time? <laughs> and I was like, you... And and I, I and that was the last time. And we didn't speak for like six months. And I just because I I was just like I'm done. I I'm not going to do this to myself. This is stupid. And then so you know like I said I was, so I was with you know uh, as working as a wine steward at Wild Oats, and they were working on the second album. And there was a Japanese song that he wanted me to sing the lead on. And because he knows that I grew up speaking Japanese, um, I'm not fluent at all, but I grew up speaking some and I, you know, he knew that I could sing it. Mm -hmm. And I had never even been in a recording studio before that, you know. And so, um, so yeah, so he asked me to come in and do that. And then I introduced him to another song uh, called Anna that, um, and I kind of, it's not really the lead, but I, I kind of sing a du duet with China Forbes. Mm -hmm on it and that was on the second album and then he really wanted me to be in the band and was trying to figure out how, you know how he could make it work and he's because he's like I love your energy you're on the, you're, you when you're on stage you're dancing and no one else dances and on, on the stage and it gets people they love it and um, and then you know one so so I've performed with them a few a few times those two songs um, and one night, or one or early morning, like 3.30 in the morning, Thomas calls me and says, I figured it out. Like, you know, what if we teach, what if we give you percussion lessons? 
we pay for percussion lessons so that you have something to do when you're not singing. <laughs> you know, so you so you don't have to get on stage, get off and like because it's it's distracting and you know, and I was like. He's like, and you, I want you to be a permanent member of the band. And, and that was 2002 or three. I, I think I officially joined in 2003, but we had started recording. I started working in the studio with them in 2002, maybe even 2001. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he just said, you know, when he said, I want you to be in the band, I just jumped at the chance. Mm -hmm. Because I just rem distinctly rem remembered how bummed I was mm -hmm. that I had that you know that I wasn't a part of Sympathique, that I wasn't a part of the buzz that was Pink Martini, mm -hmm. and not because I've, I like I I'm, I I'm, I I don't I don't want fame and fortune all that stuff you know it's just I to be able to sing to be able to sing and dance. And sing in, in foreign languages. I mean, I, I've I've studied and I've speak a few languages. I grew up in a Japanese household in a Mexican neighborhood, and you know, foreign languages are a part. Like they're literally a part of me. Mm -hmm. And I love to travel. My dad was a um, uh, uh, worked in aeronautics and worked um, for a, an airline for many years. And I got the travel bug when I was young. So. I mean, Pink Martini to me was, and still is, like such a perfect thing for me because of all those things to travel, to get paid to do all those things. I mean, I get paid to sing. I get paid to dance and sing, you know, sing in the foreign languages and to travel mm -hmm. and to eat, you know, in Paris at like the best restaurants in Paris, the best restaurants in San Sebastian. To, you know, to f fly to, you know, um, to, you know, Australia, New Zealand, be all over the world and taste wines and pair wines from there with the food from there, that, and to get paid for all of that. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of an insane combination of things, that, you know, it's like my life as a sommelier is so different, like separately, they're so different. Mm -hmm. It's so different from my life as a musician but the travel like it's it, they they cl they come they clash or they they um what's the word i'm looking for they work together you know what i mean they come together mm -hmm. and that is my life you know mm -hmm. so again you know he when he asked me i was like of course so yeah <laughs> sorry, that's I mean, that's an amazing. A lot answer. of a lot of that's amazing. A lot of words. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what we're, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Um, so with, with wine, you talked about kind of um, kind of finding it and kind of growing into wine, which was kind of a common theme among our interviews. Tell me about the points at which um, you felt comfortable in your in your in your wine knowledge and, and comfortable putting together a wine list or comfortable being a wine steward and suggesting something how long does that take and and what were the parts of that of the kind of educational process that you enjoyed the most i would i would say that being a wine steward at wild oats was gave me a lot of confidence um you know we had a uh uh the, at, le at least at my store the laurelhurst store uh we had um, a, a, the wine shelves, it was kind of a square thing with wine shelves, leaves floor to ceiling. But then all the stacked wines, I was able to choose. Mm -hmm. So the wines that were on the shelf, I think were, were you know, I had, we had to have. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, think, I think working at Wild Oats, it, uh, I was living in a, I was in, in a little bit of a bubble, I think. Um, in that people were into um, organic wines, they really into organic. They and, and you know or organically grown mm -hmm. wines made with organically grown grapes and, um, uh, but also just people were interested. They asked. I spent a lot of time on the floor, suggesting wines, and that to me gave me so much confidence and pe knowing and like people coming back. 
-hmm. specifically, and they were to ask for me, all, you know, not all, you know, sure, mm -hmm. not, you know, some people didn't, you know, they didn't care who was helping them, but there were a lot, there were enough people that came back specifically for me and who gave me feedback on the last wine that they, you know, and I just, that was, that, and that was, that was it for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, my, my goal at the time was to open a wine shop because I want, I was like, I want to do, this is what I want to do. You know, this, you know, um, and I felt really confident. It was, I was really confident that I knew what I was doing mm -hmm. and that, you know, that I could run a successful business if that was what I had to do. Mm -hmm. Tell me about building a, a wine list, uh, either for a for a for a shop shelf or for a restaurant. How, how does the process work for you? What how do you fill out a list, and, and what are the important things you're looking for? My I, my biggest thing is balance. I think it's really important to um, to never um, alienate anyone. I mean, to to alienate as few people as as you can. And so I've always felt like having a good, having, a, and, and as a sommelier, I think my favorite thing about being a sommelier, I love, I love seeking out, finding, and recommending really cheap wines that are really good, that are, that are great price. You know what I mean? And, and passing, and passing that on, that, that to me, I love doing that. I think for, for me, it's easy to have the top wines, all top rated wines, and then it, that's the that's the easy part. Mm -hmm. That's that doesn't take a lot of work. I want to work. I want to work for my customers. Mm -hmm. It's it's and that that's it sounds kind of cheesy, but I'm I want to work for them. I want to find the best wines, absolutely best wines possible for the money, and to pass that on. And so, but I also again I like to have, you know. Highly rated wines, if I like them, I'm not gonna, you know, typically I'm not gonna just put a, you know, a highly rated wine on a list or on a, on a shelf at, a, at the store strictly on someone else's mm -hmm. score. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's some wineries, some winemakers that, whose wines they, you know, like I will just say it, Mike Etzel, Mike, Michael Etzel, you know, Beaufrere, like he, like, his wines score really well, like very consistently score very well, and every single wine that I've had of his, I've loved. Like he's, to me, I think he's, he's awesome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I, so I don't have to taste every single vintage that gets high scores of, you know, but, um, but if there's a, it, you know, it, it, sometimes reps will say, send me an email like, hey, look at this great score on this wine that you've never had. You want some? Like, no. If, if you can taste me on it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And some, you know, randomly, if, if it's a crazy score, then yeah, <laughs> then sure. And I'll just trust, you know, I'll just trust that, that it is and, you know, just, but it randomly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But again, you know, so I, my goal is to have inexpensive and approachable Mid mid price and then high end, and just you know where people when people just want to go for it, um, people who you know are looking for something cool. I like having things that are hard to find or hard to get, um, and yeah, I mean, and again, I you know, is whenever I can, I I'm tasting the wines before before it, before I put them put them on a shelf or on a list. Like, I mean, you know, I'm not going to taste every single vintage. You know, but if it's consistent, you know, mm -hmm. if it's consistently good and I, you know, then I'm going to trust that it's going to be good, you know, next year. And, if, you know, as long as I can taste, you know, the wines ran, you know, once in a while. Mm -hmm. 2013 was a tough year <laughs> for, for, you know, for, for the Willamette Valley Pinot. I mean, that was really one of the only ones where I'm like, hmm, I, 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 I am... I really have to taste this wine before I put it on my shelf, you know, so. I'm curious about, uh, obviously, you, you came into Oregon without knowledge of Oregon's wine industry or much knowledge of Oregon's wine industry specifically. Uh, how did you, 
how did you learn Oregon specifically? The the, the producers, the varietals, the the kind of the cool, the the, the cool, the the, the exciting. Uh, how long did you learn it, and and what kind of interaction were you having with the industry in your various roles? Um, again, I think you know, uh, I'm working in the restaurant business, um, and and also being into wine. You know, it, you know when I moved up here in '92, I mean I I was really into you know big Napa cabs and Chardonnays. I mean, you know, I liked some others as well, uh, of course. Um, and, you know, and, and in those days, in, in the early 90s, I mean, Oregon Pinots were, and, and Chardonnays were not, I, I didn't have a lot of great ones, frankly. And so I wasn't super excited about them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but you know, I, I'm really into visiting wineries. I love, um, so I, I had set up a, a, like two or three uh, wine tours with the, for the staff at BEMA. Um, and we, we, you know, we would get a big bus and you know, the whole staff, and we had a big staff. Um, and we, you know, the whole staff would go to you know, visit a, a few wineries. Um, so I set a, like, I think three of those up, two or three. Um, and and actually, when I before I moved here, actually I don't think I ever even had gone to a winery before. I don't think I ever went to a winery in in Calif when I was living in California. So I think that came, that sort of went hand in hand with it. it. Was like I was like I was getting excited about the the experience mm -hmm. of visiting a winery and getting meeting a winemaker and and being in the you know being in the the barrel room and tasting you know with the thief and you know do, doing barrel tastings and you know I that's it was it was so infectious you know and and eventually you know I, I feel like you know at the more excited I got about wine in general the more excited I was getting about Oregon wine and at the same time and this may not be true like anyone wants seeing this may you know being in the wine business may may disagree but I feel like in the like in the '90s, quality and this the 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 quality and the what winemakers were doing just it just gained momentum and it and it wasn't what it is now. I mean, you know, at, at anyone in the Oregon wine business will tell you that Oregon Chardonnay was not in the '90s was not what it is now. You know, and so um, yeah, it's, it's you know it's that's kind of how it happened. You mentioned that even when you had a, a restaurant that was Piedmont focused, Italian focused, you still had an Oregon selection. I'm I'm curious, um, especially as a rest in the restaurant, kind of the restaurant side of your, of your of your work. What was the expectation from your customers when it came to Oregon wines? Were they excited about Oregon wines? Were you having to push Oregon wines on them? What was the kind of the their the reception of the wines you had? Well, one of the reasons that I did continue w with Oregon. A wine as a focus, as a sort of a side focus, uh, when, when we opened or when we rebranded as Copia, was because I knew that people would be coming in wanting Oregon wines. Mm -hmm. And you know, truth be told, I love you know I love having an excuse to you know have some Oregon Pinot at the end of a day too you know, and behind the bar you know. Um, so, but you know, it's, and also being you know so close to downtown virtually downtown, um, it, you know, it, uh, we got, a, we had a lot of tourists, not a lot, but we had a fair number of tourists and people who had, who were visiting Portland or maybe doing a stop in Portland and then going out to wine country for a weekend or a week or, or maybe on their way back and they're spending a night in Portland. And um, I think it was an expectation that mm -hmm. any wine bar in Oregon or in Portland would have Oregon wines. Um, and so that again, that was I think it was expected and part of the reason. But um, but like I said, I'm you know I, I've I've gained such a passion for Oregon wine wines uh, in general that um, it was I, I had to mm -hmm. have Oregon wines on it. Well, it ties me it ties nicely into my next question, which is about Made in Oregon specifically. So now you're at a place that is entirely Oregon. 
uh, and it's a, it's a big state with a lot of wine in it. So, so tell me about how you approach that, uh, what you're looking for, for to fill a made in Oregon and, and how you're kind of, uh, how you try to kind of represent the state. Um, well, first of all, as, as far as I'm concerned, is if, if the wine is made in Oregon, I don't really care what, well, I, d I don't mind if the grapes are from Washington or Canada. Like, I don't think we have any that are made with grapes from anywhere but Washington. I mean, or besides or Oregon and Washington. We just have a handful that are made from grapes uh, in the uh, Columbia Gorge AVA or the Columbia Valley AVA on the or Washington side. Um, so, yeah, so basically the wine has to be made in Oregon. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot what your main question was. Just curious how you go about representing a state with so much to offer. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, like I said, one of my big things is balance. I'm Libra. I'm like hardcore Libra. So I like, I, I, I need balance. And, um, but I think it's important to, for, uh, uh, the, uh, wine, the wine shelves to have a good balance of, um, price points, but also a good representation of all the areas of Oregon because, you know, I mean, there, you know, I, I think there are a lot. In fact, when when I brought some uh, wines in from, you know, the the Rocks District. Mm -hmm. Actually, when I first started, I don't think the Rocks District was even a navy yet. Not yet. Um, but I but it said Walla, you know, it said Walla Walla, and my boss brought me in and said, "Why are you bringing Washington? Why are you bringing, you know, Walla Walla wines?" And I said, "Well, Walla Walla actually dips down into Oregon, and so you know, so I had to school him about it." Um, but, uh, you know, so ironically, I don't, I, have, we, I think we have one wine from the, Rock, the Rocks District right now, unfortunately. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, for me, I think it's important to have a, a good representation of wines from Hood, the Hood River or the Columbia Gorge area, um, you know, uh, the Umpqua Valley, Roseburg, er, and um, uh, the, uh, the Rogue Valley as well. And, you know, I, I obviously, not obviously, but it seems obvious to me that, that our sales are, are generated by Pinot Noir um, from, from the Willamette Valley, of course. Um, and so I have to have a good representation of, of Pinot Noirs. And I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, someone will show me a wine from a Pinot Noir from you know, Hood River or, you know, but people, my, our customers really want Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. Um, and I have had some, some uh, uh, Pinot Noirs from the Rogue mm -hmm. and the Umpqua and the Columbia Gorge AVA. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, I, 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 and I, I think there are a lot of people that don't know that there are Great white wines that are made in, like you know, some Sauvignon Blancs are. So there's some great Sauvignon Blancs from Willamette Valley, mm -hmm. um, and but there are some really there's some really nice cabs made, being made in in the Rogue mm -hmm. um, and Cab Franc. You know, some great Rhone varieties or varietals that are being grown and made in um, in the Rogue Valley and. Um, I, yeah, I think for me, that's. A, I, I want people to be able to, you know, look at our selection, and, and I want everyone who's shopping for wine to find something that they'll, that they're excited about, mm -hmm. at, you know, that and that they're really happy about. When it comes to looking for something new, whether it's a new varietal, whether it's a new producer, or or a new label. Um, do you find most things that are you seeking things out? Are you discovering things on your own, or are most things being brought to you and, and for you to kind of examine? Uh, you know, at this time, because of the pandemic, I, you know, there there aren't. Uh, I mean, I think I've been to two trade tastings in the last two years, um, and uh, and I'm not sitting down with reps. I'm, I'm being kind of selective about sitting down with reps who want to bring wines to, to you know, share with me. 
So, you know, so honestly, in the for the last couple of years, I feel like um, it, I'm I'm a little bit in a in a rut, and I haven't really discovered a whole lot that that I'm super excited about. Mm -hmm. um, but there have been, you know, like Andrew Riker mm -hmm. and his Odeon wines are amazing. His Chardonnay is unbelievable. That the the uh, seven is it Seven Springs? No, Seven Springs mm -hmm. Chardonnay. Um, but yeah, so I'm randomly like someone will say, "Hey, can I bring you some samples?" And so that's you know, that's kind of how it's happened in the last two years. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier that your your biggest passion with wine is is, is the pairing aspect of it, wine wine with food. I'm curious about. We, whenever people tell me that, I'm always curious about the philosophy behind that because there are so many different ways to pair wines and food. So, tell me about yours. How, how do you, when it comes to pairing, what are you looking for, and, and what are the kind of uh, the kind of the the philosophy, the trait behind what you're, how you pair wine and food? Um, I'm always looking for. I try, I try not to just find a pairing that I like. I've I've kind of I sort of focus on finding a pairing at least when it's for wine dinners and stuff like that or for events. Um, I'm looking for a pairing that's just naturally. If if you if is assuming the person didn't just brush their teeth or didn't just you know have some lemonade or coffee or cigarette, m most people will. You know, most people's palates will be pleased mm -hmm. by that particular pairing. I think it's, you know, I think that there, well, I do know that there are, you know, chemical things that happen um, that are, that ha all things being equal, happen to everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm always kind of trying to find that, you know, that pairing of not just flavors, but also just, um, uh, textures and you know that chemical uh, balance mm -hmm. and chemistry you know just to how they work together mm -hmm. so so obviously you you talked a bit earlier about sort of the, the changes in the wines you've the Oregon wines you've had and, and since you've since you've sort of started drinking Oregon wine obviously a lot of changes in the industry Tell me about the the biggest sort of changes from your perspective that you've noticed in Oregon wine since becoming a part of it, becoming aware of it. What what's the biggest difference between then and now, and, and what does the industry look like to you now in, in 2022? I would say that the biggest change is Chardonnay from the Lama Valley. I mean, my lord, is there some amazing. Chardonnay is being made up here, and that it was not happening. I mean, there might have been a few. Maybe there were some that I had never tried when I, you know, in the '90s. Um, and I have had some that were that were good, that were fine. Mm -hmm. But it, like, absolutely, that is, in my from my perspective, the mm -hmm. biggest, most, the most impactful change on the industry in Oregon is the Chardonnay. And I mean, you know, there's that there's the Chardonnay symposium that's happening. I don't know, in a next, couple next weeks, week. yeah, soon, yeah. Um, that I'm going to, and I'm super excited about. I it's just, you know, and I'm not doing the, the seminars, I'm just, I'm just doing the tastings, you know. <laughs> Actually, I tried to get into one of the seminars and it was full, so, but, um, um, so yeah, so that, I think that's the biggest change. And what was your other part of the question? I'm just curious, what, the, what, the, what does the Oregon wine industry look like in 2022? Um, I, I, you know, I, I, so I moved to wine country. This is kind of the northern edge of wine country, but you know, we're on the, in the Shehala Mountains, mm -hmm. and um, and I moved to wine country for a reason because I, like I, I, you know, I, I, I want to be close to the winery. I, I visit winemakers all the time now, you know, um, and but the thing is, you know, I, I, every time I'm driving around, even though I live here. I see a sign for a new winery that I'd never even heard of, you know, and um, you know, and you know, I see a, you know a lot of people coming in and investing money, 
big, big, you know, names in the wine industry and international wine industry coming in, mm -hmm. investing money, um, and you know, it, it's it's a testimony that things are really. I mean, we're. I think we're literally just at the beginning of it. In some ways, I kind of feel like yes, we're we're, we're you know, we as an industry, you know, a wine industry are we're we're there, but like I, you know. I really feel like this is just the tip of the iceberg, mm -hmm. and because there's, you know, and again, as I'm driving around, there's still a lot of land, a lot of great soil that's not being used for grapes um, in in the area in the Willamette Valley anyway, and I'm sure all over the state. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it, for two for tw 2022, it's hard for me to say. I mean, partially because I I don't. I haven't been able to um, go to tastings. I haven't been to s seminars. I haven't been, to, you know, and it's hard. I don't have my f finger on the pulse as much. I don't know if, who does really, the, you know, since the pandemic started. Um, and so it's hard for me to say, to try to even predict what 2022 is going to be like. Mm -hmm. It's all going to de depend on, you know, the, you know, the COVID and. How you know as things open up, I mean the in the restaurant industry it like has been just decimated, you know, and I know it's really tough. And then you know, and you know, 2020, we had the fires, which were literally just right there, the big Shehalem fire, mm -hmm. um, you know that, you know the smoke taint on the Pinots, it's like it's changed the game for at least you know for a, a year of vintage. Mm -hmm. And I know that some some uh, some wineries were uh, had smaller production of the 2019s. So, you know, the people, you know, a lot of wineries, a lot of distributors are kind of trying to parcel it out, you know, so that make it so they can make it through to the 21, you know, vintage. And um, so that's definitely something that's going to, you know, the 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 fires, the smoke taint. Uh, and the fact that people just didn't use Pinot, and that there's because there's and resulting in very little wine, mm -hmm. it's going to impact the business for sure. Mm -hmm. I think you know it's and you know especially you know a, a business called Made in Oregon, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. What do you see then? Uh, obviously, hard, you mentioned hard to predict, but as, as as you look ahead for the for the future of the Oregon wine industry, are there any? Is there anything you're looking forward to happening? Is there anything you're afraid of happening as you kind of look ahead to what the industry is going to become? Um, you know, I I I, I am I go back and forth on the idea of some of the big guns coming in and you know buying out mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. you know and you know it it's hard for me you know um i i i, I love supporting the little guy that's I, I just i do you know um you know some of the ones that are being bought out are not were not little guys when they were you know when they were bought out but much littler than they are now mm -hmm. with the you know with their investors and all that stuff so i you know so I, i'm a little bit afraid that it's going to get it's, it's going to become too much and it's going to be like disneyland it's going to be you know what i mean i i don't think it's ever going to be like disneyland i don't think it's ever going to feel like napa i mean for many reasons obviously but um but I'm a, I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want it to be anything like that. I, I, the thing I love about the Oregon industry is the, the, all the t little producers. And of course, I love, you know, I love Domaine Serene Wines. You know, I love, you know, I love some, you know. But I, you know, I, I, my hope is that there will be a lot more smaller wineries popping up. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not uh, in that side of the industry, so I don't even know, it, like, it, it, if people are making money, with, you know, with the smaller 
wineries or not. And, you know, as we all have heard, you know, to make a big fortune or to make a fortune in the wine business, you got to start with a fortune, you know, and, you know, I, I don't know how true that is. I, I think I'm assuming it is partially true or it helps <laughs> to start with a fortune, you know, but um, I don't think it'll ever become that. And, the, you know, the thing that I love about the Oregon wine industry is it feels like a big family. That's one thing that I would miss if it got too big. If it got, if it be, if, you know, all these investors, these, you know, from foreign countries that are, then never even visit the, you know, that aren't part of the family, you know, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I feel like we're all kind of doing this together. And it's so, it, that's one of the one thing that I think makes the Oregon wine industry so unique, especially, especially the Willamette Valley, I have to say. People like people, and because I've been to I've been to the Rogue, I've been to the Umqua a lot. I've been to a lot. I've been to Hood River to all the wineries that I know of. Um, I've been to the Rockster Street, Walla Walla, you know, the Oregon side of Walla. I've been and Willamette Valley is so unique. I've been to wine regions around the world, and the Willamette Valley is just. It just feels like a family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know it's like the, we're, we're working together. There, no one's working against. And, and people, I feel like people visit other wineries. They, they taste other, the other each other's wines, and they're, you know, and it's a it's a family thing. You know, it's a there's a lot of camaraderie here that doesn't exist mm -hmm. in other areas of the world, and even in the state. So what about for the future for yourself? Uh, you, you hinted at a new project you're starting. You can talk about that if you want to or not. But what, el what else are you kind of looking ahead to for yourself in, in the future? You know, I, I, I will always be in the wine industry. And I'm, I'm an Oregonian now for the rest of my life. And I, I love, I'm so happy where I live right now. Just you saw the view. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, um, I, I, I'm here for the rest of my life. I will, and I will be in the wine industry for the rest of my life. Even if when I like, even if pink martinis, like I, I will be in the restaurant business or the, the, the wine industry forever. What that looks like moving forward. I'm not exactly sure. Um, obviously I'm, you know, I'm, I'm st still at made in Oregon and I love it. Um, I don't love everything about it, but you know, um, I love most of what I do and, um, you know, I'm always trying to think of other things that I can do in the wine industry um, w while being on the road. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And if you know of anything, if you know of any, anything that I can do, if you want to hire me. No, um, but so uh, some, a couple friends of mine, Sean and Mary, uh, Sean Martin and Mary Kressler have Vindulge. Um, and they started out. She started out. It, she had. A, it was a basically a wine blog, and then it kind of um, transformed into like a. Um, he's kind of a master smoker, mm -hmm. and so it kind of tr transformed into a website and blog about uh, like pairing s open fire foods, mostly sp smoked foods, mm -hmm. uh, with wine, and uh, and they have they have a company called Ember and Vine. Um, where they go to wineries and they he brings he, he brings his 17 foot smoker, and um, and smokes and you know we've done we've done events you know like we've done wine dinners at wineries, um, mostly wineries um, but we've done you know uh, release party events and stuff like that, um, but they uh, w uh, in October uh, or well in October last year uh, 2021. Um, we launched a wine shop and wine club, and um, and it's called Vindulge Wine. And uh, so I'm the I'm the sommelier curator. So I I so we kind of work on the wine selection together. But the the more that the more comfortable I am at some some of the process processes, um, the more I'm I'm kind of just picking the wines and then telling them. And I'm writing the copy and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. most of this, most of that stuff, I can do on the 
on the road, like the writing copy and, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't taste the wines, you know, and, but, you know, when I'm, I'm, especially since COVID's happening and we're not on the road as often as we normally would be, um, it's been easier. I've been home more mm -hmm. often, so I've been able to taste the wines before we um, select and dis make decisions on the wines. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I want to. That's that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Mm. I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. Yeah. Sounds like it. Well, that's excellent. Um, that's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover? I don't think so. I'm so sorry. I like I go off don't. and I just. <laughs> that is the whole point so, where we're here. Yeah. No apology needed. That's a, that was excellent. Um, thank you so much for your time, for your hospitality yeah, here today. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you. And uh, we'll let you off the hook.